hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming and um, sharing your lunchtime or morning or evening with us. Um, I'm Elizabeth Wilson. I'm the director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society at Dartmouth. And I'm here with colleagues today to share our new book, thanks to Philippe Tortel. Um, the way we'll work is um, Philippe will give a brief introduction of, of, of the project. Each of the different chapter co-authors that are with us today will speak for six minutes, and then we'll be fielding your questions. So if you want to type your questions, Stephanie, who's up in the corner, will be getting them. If you could put who your question is addressed to um, as it's addressed, then I'll be reading them out and we'll be uh, directly um, answering them after we've, we've had the talk and we've tried to structure so we have a lot of time for back and forth. And with that, Philippe. Hi, good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. First, I'd like to start by thanking Elizabeth for suggesting that we do this and for the wonderful support team at Dartmouth who've made it happen on such short notice. And of course, I want to thank the uh, panelists who are joining us and as well the other authors and contributors to the book, many of whom I see have, have joined on. So thank you all. Of course, without you, this would not have happened. I'm going to take just uh, a few minutes to give you some background about the genesis of the project and the book and, and some of the connections that were built through the process of assembling this wonderful team of authors. The, the project goes back for me to uh, sort of a pivot I think I had in my career maybe six, seven years ago. A number of different things happened around that time. I became a full professor at UBC and I figured I had sort of nothing, nowhere left to go in terms of the academic rank. And it felt like an interesting time to explore what I could do to move beyond building domain expertise and disciplinary expertise to think a little bit more broadly and to assume some responsibilities that I felt were now upon me to, to move beyond uh, strictly academic things and to and try to develop some impact beyond the walls of the university. That was around the time that I started working in the high Canadian Arctic. I'm an oceanographer by training and, and a professor at UBC. I, I guess I didn't say that, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And at the time that I started working in the Arctic, I initially approached that with very much of a scientific focus. I am an oceanographer. I go to sea on ships and we measure all kinds of, of variables in, in the oceans. And that was for many years the lens through which I had seen my craft and my work. But as I began to work in the Arctic, it, it became apparent immediately that there were direct and immediate impacts of that scientific understanding for communities who lived in the Arctic and depended upon ecosystems to sustain their livelihood and cultural practices. And through a rel relatively rapid process, I became much, much more aware, much more in tune with the implications of science for broader societal implications and, and communities. And that was around the time that I also became a scholar at something called the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at UBC. And uh, within a couple of years of that, I, I became director of the Institute. In a nutshell, the Institute aims to foster interdisciplinary collaborations across all different fields. We connect people or we connected people across UBC and from around the world to come together and address complicated problems from these multifaceted perspectives. And of course, my experience in the Arctic had convinced me that there were many problems like that that really required expertise across fields to, to make significant progress. And one of the things I had the opportunity to do as the director of the Institute was to facilitate those kinds of conversations. My first or maybe second year at the Institute was 2017. That was the year that Canada s celebrated its sesquicentennial, 150th anniversary of Confederation. And it was a time when people across the country were really beginning to consider what the country had, had achieved, what it had meant, but also to reflect on some of its darker historical legacies. And it was in that spirit that I felt we had an opportunity to bring together some smart people from across the country to, to reflect on what, that, what the nation meant at that moment in its history. And that resulted in the publication of, uh, of my first edited book called Reflections of Canada. And it was a really interesting experience to bring people together and to see what, what, what would happen when ideas were allowed to inter intermingle freely. And it was actually such a good experience that the following year I decided to, to have another kick at the can. It was 2018 and uh, it, I'd become aware or it was known to me that 2018 was going to mark the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War, which in Canada and the Commonwealth is celebrated as Remembrance Day. And taking that anniversary as a catalyst, we then put together another book with a different collection of authors called Memory. And it was a really broad reflection on, on memory and remembrance in many, many different contexts, not just human memory, but earth system memory, interstellar memory. And it was, a, again, a fascinating romp and exploration through all these ideas. 
Now, uh, shortly after Memory was, was released, for reasons I won't go into now, I, I ended up resigning as director of the Institute. And I found myself, um, I won't say exactly adrift, but I found myself with some time on my hands and some ideas sort of without venue of expression. And I thought, you know, maybe what I need is to just try to do another book. And what I had learned with the first two was that anniversaries can be significant points in time when people will focus their attentions, at least for a moment, a month among the, the scatter and, and hype of all the media that we're exposed to. When we come to these pivotal anniversaries and people tend to like round numbers, 10 and 50 and 100 and so on, it does create an opportunity for some interesting conversation. And it's not an exaggeration to say, I literally just went on the web and searched for milestone anniversaries in 2020. And one of the first things that came up was Earth Day. And actually this of all the things I'd done was something I actually knew something about as an oceanographer. And I thought, well, huh, that's kind of interesting. And I started reading a little bit about Earth Day and looking at some, some fantastic vintage uh, video clips on the web and realizing what a perfect confluence of science and society and economics and law this was and what a wonderful opportunity it would be to bring together another terrific group of people and have them reflect on what has happened to planet Earth over the last 50 years, not just from a biophysical sense, but how our societies have evolved to adapt to and, and hopefully mitigate some of the changes that we've inflicted on the planet. And with those sort of marching orders, I, I quickly assembled a, a cast of fantastic contributors to the book, four of which you're going to hear from today. And uh, I've been working closely with them over the last number of months. And the result is the book that you have perhaps seen on the screen and in due course will get in, in your hands as a hard copy, should you choose to do that. So that is really all I'd like to say for introduction. I'd like to now turn it over to our speakers and I'm looking forward to hearing what they're saying and to interacting with all of you. I was delighted to see a, a strong interest in and in a large number of participants. So our first speaker will be uh, Professor Deborah McGregor. She's an associate professor and Canada Re Research Chair at York University. She works at the forefront of indigenous environmental justice and indigenous research theory and practice. From the very get-go of this book, it was extremely important to me that we have strong representation of indigenous worldviews. After all, Earth Day is a relatively modern concept to Western societies, whereas environmental notions are deeply embedded over thousands of years of indigenous culture and practice. And so that was an area that was absolutely critical. And uh, UBC has a strong group of indigenous scholars, but wanting to, to branch out a little bit beyond university, I started asking around for people who could really address this with eloquence and, and uh, authority. And a number of people pointed me to Deborah. So I was delighted when she accepted the offer to join us. And I'll now have her give some reflections about her contribution. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you for that context and uh, for doing all this work to, to put this together. Um, I think I'll, I'll just start with, um, like if, because, you know, I, I look at it as Earth Week as opposed to just uh, Earth Day, which was, I guess, on Wednesday, depending on where you are on the planet, it would have been the day before, the day after. Um, it's just also just acknowledging the, the lands and the territories that we're on as well, and, and not only acknowledging the uh, Indigenous peoples there, but also the, what people would call the non-human world, what I would call from an Anishinaabek perspective, um, our other relatives who are also care caretakers uh, for, the, for the lands and waters and territories that we, uh, that we now enjoy. That sets a little bit of the stage for uh, just some remarks that I want to share about the, the chapter that I um, contributed. Um, a beautiful work, by the way, like I, just, I, I love the whole, I love the whole thing um, and trying to stay within five minutes to do it. So um, I wanted to, to start by saying that um, the, the work that I did was really trying to, to show the recognition of Indigenous peoples. Um, Unfortunately, initially with the very first Earth Days, Indigenous peoples weren't formally in, involved in it, but then as some scholars like Daniel Wildcat would say, uh, he would say, well, every day was Earth Day from uh, an Indigenous worldview uh, and ontological um, perspective. <clears throat> um, so in, in terms of the approach that I take around Indigenous knowledge systems, legal systems, and, and governance systems is, is a recognition that there's diversity across the planet in terms of Indigenous peoples. Um, so, so we know that, but at the same time, there's also commonality. Like one of the things that I found that's common, and you see these evident in the Indigenous environmental declarations that have come out every time there's like world meetings, UN meetings around, um, 
environmental issues, including uh, climate change, is this idea of having an obligation and responsibility uh, to the earth itself. How our idea of, of the earth or mother earth is, is thought about and related to um, in a very different way. Um, and this, this relationship is also uh, reciprocal. Like we also rely on, um, the earth relies on us and then we also rely on the earth. This is obligation that we have uh, in relation to the earth that's reflected uh, in, our, uh, in our legal orders. And as you know, relationships require work. Like you have to work on relationships with the earth uh, every day and, and meet our obligations. It's not something that, that we could do and it's convenient or when we feel like it, but it's something that has to happen every day. So then I turn to the, the status quo and the status quo clearly is not really working all that well. Uh, the time we're living in right now could be a pivotal moment in thinking through how do we want to be different? Like, like I'm thinking we don't really want to go back to normal because normal <laughs> isn't sustainable. So, so what, it, what do we vision for um, our future? So this, the status quo is problematic and it's not uh, delivering on a sustainable uh, world uh, or future. And Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous people's knowledge is becoming a lot more relevant to what can this, what, what can this future look like? What can this transformation look like? What can we do? Uh, how can we do things differently? And that's a major paradigm shift. Uh, very early on in a lot of the early um, global environmental gatherings, Indigenous peoples were this problem that had to be solved. Very vulnerable people, marginalized, which is true, but also now they have something to contribute. That's a major shift in uh, that I started to see with the Brentland Report uh, and the uh, Earth Summit that happened in, in Rio, the first one in 1992. So these, these, um, these really sort of started to have an influence. I probably have a couple minutes left. Uh, so how, like what are these advances that happen when this paradigm shift um, occurred roughly you know four decades ago um, one of them is the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples how that can also be used as a framework to move forward to a sustainable future um, the declaration on mother earth as a living entity in 2010 i see these kind of innovations as really um, critical and important because they really they really point to a shift in, in how we understand our relationship uh, with the earth itself. So this idea of living well with the earth, um, this concept recognizes the agency uh, of the earth itself, um, returning to a dialogue with, uh, with mother earth. Um, indigenous peoples wanting to share uh, their knowledge and legal traditions and ideas around how we can move to a more uh, equitable and reciprocal relationship uh, with the earth. So we every day we'd be thinking about what can our gift be back to the earth as opposed to how the earth has to continually uh, give back to, to us. So what we see emerging now is, is our new ways of thinking that are gaining more, uh, gaining more credence and that's like uh, earth jurisprudence, earth justice, wild law, and this is where um, nature or aspects of nature like rivers or mountains start gaining legal personality, start being recognized as having uh, rights in and of themselves. So I, I just wanted to, to end this in thinking about where we've been, the moment that kind of we're in now, um, and where we could go in the next 50 years. And I'm thinking what I would like to see more relevant uh, in our conversations is, is actually being able to um, enable these relationships with the earth itself. So we're not just celebrating Earth Day as a separate thing from us, but actually with the earth itself and understanding the earth is having its own agency and we have this obligation, uh, reciprocal obligation. I'd also like to see love as being part of that conversation. This is like, we talk about it all the time in indigenous circles, like it's a very relevant thing, uh, concept to be, to be having in our way of thinking in terms of what are we gonna to do to show our love for the earth? What does that look like today, next week, 10 years from now, 50 years from now? Um, what does our love look like for the earth and for future generations? So I think my five minutes are up and hopefully that gave you a taste of that uh, chapter. And again, thank you for joining us and for listening. To be glad. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. What a, what a wonderful place to end and then to begin new conversations. So we will hold the questions for everyone until the end, and I will move on to introducing our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Tapio Schneider, who is a climate scientist at Caltech. He is currently leading the Climate Modeling Alliance, which is a, a multi-institutional collaboration 
building a new climate model that is uh, learning automatically from data using advanced machine learning methods. Tapio is someone, unlike many of the authors that I did have a connection to before the book, we were graduate students together in the same department back in the early 1990s during the days of the early IPCC reports. And so we knew each other quite well and, and probably had not seen each other for near 20 years until he visited uh, UBC to give a seminar in my department last year, right around the time when I was preparing yeah. the final list of authors. And we went for coffee and we chatted about this and that. I mentioned the book and, and to my delight, he agreed on the spot, if I'm not mistaken, to contribute a chapter. And so I'm, I'm delighted to introduce him and to give him the floor to, to share some remarks. Thanks, Philippe. Yeah, so my expertise is in climate science. I, I entered the field in the mid 90s as a grad student, which is when I met Philippe. And you know, I've been involved with the science for now 25 years, the, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It, it's close to my lifetime, a little bit younger, but not by much. So it was a good time to reflect both on 50 years of climate on Earth, which happens to coincide with my years on Earth, more or less. And although I've been in this business for a long while now and have been thinking about climate since high school times, it still astonishes me every day how much climate is changing and how quickly it is changing. If there's a silver lining to what we are currently going through is that I think people are starting to appreciate what exponential growth means a bit more than they did before. I used to say to my children and everyone who wanted to hear it, I just wish more people would understand the exponential function and would be so much better in planning and preparing for what is to come. So exponential growth, we also have had, for example, in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. It's just one metric, an easy metric to use to illustrate how much we have changed our environment. So CO2 in the atmosphere, we had about 270 parts per million um, for the last 10,000 or so years before the beginning of the industrial revolution. It was just wiggling up and down a bit, but 270 was more or less the value. That's when humans developed agriculture, civilization, cities, all those things. Climate was very stable during that time. And then in the late 1800s, concentrations started to slowly creep up at first because of industrialization, burning of fossil fuels. Um, by the beginning of the 20th century, it was around 295 or so parts per million, so 25 parts per million more. Um, by the first Earth Day, we were at 320 parts per million, so that's 20% 20 20 above the pre-industrial levels. You know, at the time it was clear that it can affect climate, at the time it was clear that that could be something we have to worry about at some point, but it was 20% above pre-industrial values. It was not an acute concern, perhaps, and it wasn't the acute concern driving Earth Day, which was much more concerned, the first Earth Day, which was much more concerned with local pollution, air pollution and the like, where we have made great strides and air quality throughout the Western world is much better than it was in the 1970s. So we were at 320 parts per million, 20% above pre-industrial levels in 1970. Now it's about 450 parts per million. So this is more than 50% above pre-industrial levels. And what this means, all the CO2 comes that has accumulated in the atmosphere, we now comes from human emissions. There's no ambiguity about it. And what it means is that in the last 50 years, we have added more than twice as much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than in all of human history before. It's just the last 50 years. And it's exponential growth. The concentration keeps increasing. increasing. Of course, there's been technological progress, but so far, you could Economic growth, which is the main driver of emissions, has outpaced the technological progress. Concentrations keep going up. Even emissions keep going up currently. There's, there's not even a peak in sight. Well, there is a sharp blip right now for obvious reasons, but we'll get through the current pandemic. Once we're through that, I think we'll, back, we'll be back to the rapid growth that we have seen over the last 150 years and most rapid really over the last few decades. To make this a bit more intuitive, um, every one of us puts about the weight equivalent of 10 mid-sized passenger cars of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year, children, adults included. So this is the scale of the problem. Every one of us, it's about the weight of 10 cars. So somehow we either have to eventually get that out, stop emitting that, it's the first step, and we have to get there in a way that's not disruptive on a massive scale. Um, 
right now we see, them, see a massive reduction in emissions. It might be as much as 50%, but obviously the price we pay here is much too high. I mean, that's, that's not an acceptable solution to shut down the economy to save the environment. So CO2 has gone up, temperatures have gone up by a little more than one degree centigrade since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and all of those trends keep, keep continuing. And while in 1970 you could think about climate change as a distant problem, by the time Philippe and I were in graduate school, I think it was becoming an acute problem. We, we were talking a lot at the time about mitigating climate change, what we can and should do to prevent further increases in CO2 concentrations, to, to mitigate climate change, we still have to do that. that. That conversation hasn't ended, but the thing that has profoundly changed even since 1995 to now is that mitigation is not going to be enough. Climate is changing, climate will be changing profoundly. Irrespective of policy decisions made now, there is just a long lag in whatever policy decisions we make to seeing changes in climate. Um, and we just also need to adapt to those changes. We need to adapt the infrastructure we built to the climate changes that are coming. We need to, um, some parts of the world, we need to think about whether humans can still live there, whether that's in low-lying areas near oceans or um, say in the Arctic, obviously people can still live there, but the, the changes there are dramatic. Um, well, we've had about one degree of temperature increase over the last century globally in the global mean. Over land, it's closer to one and a half degrees. In the Arctic, in, in some areas, it's three or four degrees and, and more in winter temperature increase that we have already seen. So that affects the permafrost, it affects how people are living there, how it affects ecosystems, obviously, and the like. So these are all changes that are already happening, of which we'll get more, more intense rainfall. This will be one consequence. And we'll have to figure out how to live with it, in addition to figuring out how to prevent more of these changes from happening. Um, as Philippe mentioned, I work in a climate modeling project. Our goal here is to provide the information we need to adapt to climate change and perhaps also to help mitigate it, although the mitigation problem is primarily a policy and technology problem. It's not so much a problem of providing predictions of how climate changes. It's clear we just have to figure out how to produce energy without emitting carbon. That's a bottom line for. The bottom line agenda, the top, the top, top line agenda item for the next 50 years must be that. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tapio, and that will that will tie in nicely to Elizabeth's uh, final remarks on on energy. But before we get there, I would like to introduce Professor Sheila Jasanoff. Professor Jasanoff is a I just pull it up here is a <clears throat> four-timer professor of science and technology studies at Harvard. Uh, Harvard University's Kennedy School. Her work explores the role of science and technology in law politics and the policy of modern democracy. She has authored many articles and edited or authored up to 15 books. She was someone that I, I did not know before, but uh, was again recommended by a large number of people, including my own colleague, Hadi Haladabati, who is a friend of Sheila's. And I think had he not been a friend, I, I think I probably would not have been able to get through the hundreds of requests that I believe she gets all the time. And Hadi said, well, she'd be the best one to, to do this if, if there's a chance that she'll even possibly say yes. So when Sheila did uh, agree to do this, I was pleased as I was with all of the authors. And I am pleased to welcome her to this conversation today. Thank you, Philippe, and uh, let me also add my thanks to you for pulling this wonderful book and, and collection of people together. And uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the sort of optimistic uh, aspects of an otherwise dark moment that nevertheless, in spite of being virtualized and being turned into what one colleague of mine refers to as postage stamps, we nevertheless are making new friends and are making new connections. And I hope that those things will survive the darkness of the period and, and lead us to other sorts of things. So you asked me to write about uh, science and environmentalism. And um, what I wanted to talk about was uh, the way in which science has been absolutely central to the environment, but has pointed to the need to think about the uses of science and technology jointly with other things. So there's been a tradition in particular the Western philosophy, I mean, I think that um, uh, 
th this was already called attention to earlier that other cultures have not made for this kind of separation between nature and culture. But in Western thinking, I mean, the idea that facts belong in one space and values belong in a completely different space. Um, when, you know, from the beginning of my own work looking at environmental law and policy, um, I realized that, that this was not a tenable distinction, that uh, coupled to every fact that we find about uh, the environment, uh, our normative understandings about how to go about collecting those facts in the first place, what building a consensus means, and the purposiveness of looking at the world in different ways. So uh, people talk loosely and lightly about paradigm shifts, but there are these conceptual moments and you know, around when Earth Day was first being celebrated uh, was also a time when environmental problems stopped being largely local. So everybody in this audience knows what a NIMBY is and you know, the first sort of um, rearings of environmental thinking were around that notion that environmental problems are encroaching into our backyard, so not in my backyard. But at least since the moon landings, um, people have begun to recognize the boundedness of the planet. And with that, the systematicity of many of the environmental problems that they may have experienced in different ways. So weather, everybody knew weather all along, but that weather is also climate, is one of these conceptual changes that came about through a kind of linking of scientific exploration with um, a set of changes in people's understandings of responsibility and what we're responsible for. So ideas of stewardship and that this has to be on a planetary scale and where does responsibility lie and you know who is um, supposed to take care of acting on the knowledges that we produce. These things have been front and center in the political agenda, whether that's been explicitly understood or not. So a lot of the work that's been done on linking science with environmental decision-making has tended to focus on particular kinds of controversies or problems, you know, for instance, in Europe last, last year and the year before, there's been a lot of focus on just one controversy, glyphosate. I mean, you know, why um, are some people saying it's a carcinogen or not? This is the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, which was the signature product of Monsanto. But stepping back, looking over the 50-year trajectory of environmentalism, one recognizes that something so pointed as glyphosate is really about a different set of things. It's about the degree to which our technological inventiveness can or should be changing the planet around us, uh, the degree to which the human imprint on the planet has to be thought through as itself something that we need to put under the analytic lens. Um, there's also been a kind of pushback against the sort of um, intuitive understanding that many of us had that you should go about making new knowledge and that is going to lead in and of itself to better policy making, wiser policy making. Why is that not the case? Why is it that in 2020, a year that has a lot of resonance because we all know it from eye exam charts as perfect vision, why is it that in 2020, uh, the link between knowing and acting seems to be severed, you know, in a way that enlightenment thinking would not have allowed us to believe. Um, why is it that we have a president of the United States who says one of his things and the next day the medical community of the United States is backtracking to make sure that citizens are not following prescriptions like drinking bleach based on what the president has just managed to utter. So, you know, these are not things that one would have predicted. And I think that the answer is to be found not in, not exclusively anyway, in the corruption of science by private interests. I think the answer is to some extent or to an equal degree to be found in what we've allowed to happen to our political institutions. So that you cannot have a robust uptake in society 
of the kinds of um, invaluable work that is being done in science and technology without having equal attention given to the robustness of our social institutions. So in the last you know, month or so, the word trust has reappeared in all kinds of news stories about the coronavirus. I mean, you know, who are we going to trust? Which are the trustworthy models, et cetera, et cetera. But trust has always been there in the substrate. And I think that in this moment, the moment of conjunction between an ongoing set of deliberations and thinkings about planetary stewardship and, and planetary knowledge and this crisis that we've all been flung into, uh, my hope is that we take away the lesson that we have to redevote as much political energy to thinking about what kinds of societies do we want to be based on the knowledge that we're accumulating and not only how much knowledge and what are the next questions for science and technology. So I'll stop with that for the moment. Thank you very much. Now, uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our, our host for today's event, Professor Elizabeth Wilson. Professor Wilson is a, uh, a faculty member at, uh, in the Department of Environmental Studies at Dartmouth University, and she's also the director of the Arthur L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society. Her work examines how energy systems are changing in the face of new technologies and new societal pressures with a focus on the implementation of energy and environmental policies and laws in a practical sense. And uh, Elizabeth is also someone that I did not know prior to this. I honestly don't remember the chain of events that led me to you. I'm sure that you were recommended by one or more people and uh, anyway, so I'm delighted that you're here, however it is that we managed to, to connect. Go ahead, please. Thank you, everybody. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here as well. And I also appreciate that we're talking about this book chapter, uh, our book chapters, Earth 2020, at a really unique point in human history. Um, if a pandemic happens once every 100 years, um, thinking about the future of the planet now um, really provides a, a, an important and salient viewpoint, I think, for this conversation. There's a few points that I want, um, that I tried to cover in the book chapter that I wrote with uh, Elias uh, Grove Nielsen. And I think the most important one that I just want to make sure that we leave with, and this echoes type, uh, Typo's earlier comments, but that now is an energy anomaly. For, for the last 10,000 years of humans on the planet, this is the anomaly. This is not normal. Um, and really, um, when we think about how humans have organized our societies for the last 10,000 years, um, human labor, animal labor, were really the, the forces that, that drove our societies. We've always been working towards having energy to do things, but most of us were slaves or serfs or peasants who were providing that basic energy. There were important gendered roles in terms of the work that we did. And when you think about how we use energy today to travel around the world, to make each other into postage stamps and zoom each other all across the planet, um, to light our homes and houses, it, this is the anomaly in, in, that, in that story. And it has allowed an incredible level of access to people who weren't traditionally part of the progress conversation. Um, but with that progress idea, of course, always comes regress. And when I think about the energy story, um, it's easy to think about the externalities. And today, as you hear the stories of, of towns in India who are seeing the Himalayas for the first time in 30 years because of the absence of air pollution, air pollution around the world that WHO estimates prematurely kills 4.2 million people a year, um, you appreciate the cost of our energy system on our human lives and livelihoods as we go forward as well. Um, and with this progress, regress comes our dependence on energy. We use energy for everything now. Refrigeration of our foods, pumping of our waters, lighting of our homes. And since the first Earth Day back in 1970, our energy increase per capita has increased 45%. And when we think about, and, and, and you know, Typo also talked about the resulting greenhouse gas increase at that time. 
from 1970 levels of 320 parts per million to today over 410 parts per million. So our energy use having enormous consequences on our material well-being, but also on the history and the functioning of the planet. Um, in 2018, energy use increased another 3%. And as we're thinking about the need to transition our energy system to carbon-free or sustainable systems in the world, I think it's important to understand the very different contexts within which energy is used in our societies. Um, oftentimes we spend a lot of time talking about the 2.2 billion of us that really have too much energy. Um, we fly all over the world, we have access to computers, embedded devices like our cell phones. Or we'll talk about the 1.1 billion that don't have any access to modern electricity or the two to three billion people on the planet that don't have access to modern cooking fuels. But really, I think it's also important to consider the 4.4 billion people in the middle who don't have enough energy and whose desire for um, energy rich lives is really what is leading the, and growing the trajectories going forward. So while the 2.2 billion may have caused the problem, when I flip on the light switch, I expect light. That 4.4 billion in the middle may or may not have reliable um, access to energy as they go forward. And so my, my PhD student in, in, in Nepal would all often talk about in Kathmandu, they used to have schedules um, in the city of what hours a day you would have access to electricity. So appreciating that our energy realities differ significantly depending where you are on the planet. With that said, the transition story has been one that we often focus on as we have moved from wood to coal to other sources of energy. But globally, this has not been substitutive, but it's been additive. We use as much wood today, even more globally. We use as much coal today, even more globally, even though in North America, we have shifted away. And so when we're thinking about this additive, not substitutive change, it makes the, the, the need to reduce emissions all that much harder as we go forward. And so when we're thinking about our energy challenges going forward, energy to provide basic livelihoods, energy to ensure that we can all breathe the air that we're, we're taking into our lungs, energy to ensure that there's space for others on the planet. We're now locked into a world that is not only looking at mitigating um, the emissions from our current energy system, but adapting to the climate changes that we have already pushed onto the planet. And as Typo mentioned earlier as well, our infrastructure wasn't built for the world that we are going into. And so what we have done thus far is a lot, and it is completely insufficient for the challenge facing us today. So when we're working with the students, when we're working with each other, this ability to think about this next century's challenge of creating sustainable energy systems has to be in concert with the other voices of civil society, of native populations, of science and, and civil society. And so I look forward to the conversation that we'll be having now for the next, um, next uh, 25 minutes. And please send your questions to a chat. Stephanie will be forwarding to us and we'll have the, the conversation now. So thank you everybody for coming, being part of this conversation. Um, and thank you, Philippe, for pulling this together. This has been a, a project that's pushed all of us to think about the world in new ways, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Great, thank you. So as I understand now, uh, some questions, uh, the floor will be open to questions. You can send those to Stephanie, who will uh, pass them to Elizabeth on a different continent, as I understand, and uh, all of us somewhere in, in the middle will have an opportunity to join that conversation. So we've got about 20 minutes for those questions and I will probably come back for just about uh, 60 seconds at the end to wrap up and, and wish you well. So perhaps there are some questions in already. Yep, um, first question from Dick Clapp um, for Professor Jezinoff. Will it be possible to transition from a political economy of growth to a political economy of stewardship? Well, I am most famous, I think, for having written an article article called Technologies of Humility, in which I say we should not go overboard trying to predict things, but should stick instead to, well, not instead, but should devote more energy to thinking about distributive consequences of the things that we uh, 
that we undertake so blithely. So I wouldn't presume to answer, is it going to be possible? Do we need to try? Yes, absolutely. And I think that one of the things that we need to pay attention to in this present crisis is that, that we've been, in essence, handed a, a natural experiment in all of the kinds of things that people were saying we needed to do for the sake of climate change, right? I mean, so reduce travel, reduce energy use, um, eat more sustainably, consume less. All of these things have been thrust upon us on almost 24 hours notice. And one of the questions, could society do it or not, has been answered with an overwhelming yes, partly because society has been forced to do it. But we also know that the consequences have fallen as in all crises, much more heavily on the poor and the vulnerable than on the rich and well healed, which most of us in this audience are. So I think that this question of, you know, at what price, at what cost, those normative questions need to be put really seriously back on the calendar. Uh, now that we have a kind of answer to can this be done? Yes, lots of things can be done, but it doesn't understand, uh, it doesn't begin to address the how much of it should be done and who should be doing it. I think for the richer parts of society, the fact that we've done it, I hope will be a welcome wake up call to say, yes, we can do more, more belt tightening than we've been willing to do in the past. Thank you. Um, next question for Taipo. Taipo um, will remote work change our global energy consumption and how? That's an interesting question. I mean, you hear it a lot that the nature of work will change with all that. Um, I'm not so sure. I, you know, we are in a team of 50 people in my group or so, and we are living off the fact that we all had very close personal ties built in office space we shared for a long time that makes it possible to work effic efficiently and effectively remotely now. We are, we are drawing on social capital we built and I think we all realize well we can work, we, we are fortunate we can do our work very well, but we'll all be glad to see each other more again. Um, I think there is, there is some case to be made that we all travel too much and that's something that easily can go i think a lot of it can go you know th that will be good but keep in mind that global emissions from aircraft are two percent or so of the total that's not going to solve the problem on itself i think i think there will be some aspects where we can reduce emissions work sustainably more sustainably by using technological tools but the problem we are facing here is so large that that is that is away from being enough. The only solution there really is, is finding a way of generating energy. Electricity probably would have to be probably primarily from sunlight or other renewable sources. Sunlight is the one that we have plenty of. That has to happen. Once we have that, I think we can transition to um, a more sustainable energy economy. Yeah, I mean, I note that aviation fuel is down 75% now globally. And so the massive change and how we're traveling is, is something that, that's really huge. Um, yeah. For Deborah McGregor, how do you react to or think about the climate change discourse that's centered around Western science's way of understanding this crisis? Do you see tension between these articulations and indigenous articulations of climate change? Um, thank you for that question. It's, um... It, it's it's a good one. I think I'm in. I think about it in different ways. Um, I do think that the science story has dominated, and I wouldn't say like I don't say that's a wrong story. It's just kind of you can see my hands. A limited story is how I kind of explain it. Like what are the other kind of stories that need to come into the conversation? Um, and so some work is starting to be generated around that. IPCC's made an explicit effort to now try to include. Uh, indigenous knowledge into into the assessments in Canada I'm contributing to some of those assessments and trying to include indigenous knowledge because they know it we don't have everything that we, I think Sheila mentioned this we don't have everything that we or maybe we do it's it's like what it, I think people have trouble envisioning what the transformation look like what can look like and I think indigenous peoples kind of have that because we've had to do it in a really short order like in Canada we've had to transform massively 
in order to survive um, to be who we are uh, today still um, still this nation. So there's knowledge embedded within that that I think can can be informative, uh, can inform other people who are trying to envision what can that possibly look like. Um, so I tend to look at it as uh, Indigenous knowledges uh, of Indigenous peoples and, and even non-Indigenous knowledges of, of non-Indigenous peoples are relevant to this conversation as well as how does that contribute to this unfolding of the story that we're trying to understand right now? Um, how can our knowledges contribute to um, hopefully helping the earth uh, and ourselves go in a, in a transformative uh, and different um, di direction that needed that's needed. So I think, I think now it's just kind of the way I would describe it. It's in the radar. Um, you know, people know they they need to do this. Same with the IPBS report on ecosystem and um, services. Also, was think like trying to consider Indigenous peoples um, and their knowledge into these kind of processes. But I think they they still tend to look at it as kind of data. Um, they don't they don't see that it's actually societal. That is actually ontological value systems that are part of it as well. I think, yeah, Sheila was sort of talking about this as well, more, way more eloquently than I am. So that part also needs to be part of it, like the societal part of it, like, like what also has to change in terms of governance, um, in terms of how we understand um, our relationship, like a, a central to uh, Anishinaabek thinking, which I can speak to best because that's uh, uh, what I am, is this, we have this concept where, um, where we don't keep thinking about what we're going to take from the earth like part of our thinking is what are we going to contribute back to earth what can we do to actually sustain the earth like what can we do to actually help the earth recover from what we're doing um i guess you can think about it as sort of being mitigation but it's actually it's actually uh more than that so so how can these different kind of philosophical understandings um impact more than just how can indigenous knowledge be data and the kind of assessments that people are uh are doing um, yeah, so I think that's the best way I can explain it. I think it's there. People are trying. I see people are trying to, to do it because uh, I, I know they are because they're saying, how does Indigenous knowledge fit into forestry for IPCC assessment? So, um, but also thinking about all these knowledges that are all part of the story and they need to be valued as part of the story as opposed to privileging some um, over the others, but really to Again, it's a moment to be more, um, to understand what the limitations that we've had and how we need to be a lot broader in our thinking and really trying to tell, I think, kind of a different, a different story. So hopefully, hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. It's a good question. No. Thank you. Um, there was a question on the current infrastructure for um, Tepio and, and me. When you say that our current infrastructure is not ready for the sustainable future, which aspects of our infrastructure do you think are most dire? You can go first. Climate change is moving relatively slowly, right? We're talking about decadal time scales. So when you're talking about vulnerable infrastructure, it's primarily things that last for decades. So what this means is, for example, stormwater management infrastructure, where storm drains are sized for the storms we used to have. You're expecting more intense storms in many parts of the world. The storm drains are not large enough to to handle the runoff coming from it. Mm -hmm. um, sea level rise is likewise slowly progressing. There are various plans for example, building seawalls around New York or in Miami. That's infrastructure investments that will become necessary to protect those areas. And then of course, the developing world is at enormous risk. So take Bangladesh where you have well over 10 million people living within a few feet of sea level without the means to protect themselves with the technology that in principle exists, levees and the like. And there, it, the infrastructure and the adaptation question becomes, I think, an enormous challenge. Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to just add on to that a little bit. I mean, when you see these fundamental changes in big weather systems, the National Academies had a wonderful session looking at the Upper Mississippi and the Rio Grande and how changes in water, um, mean that the future going forward is not the future the entire system has been designed for. And so they gave the example of Davenport, Iowa last year, having been at flood stage for 220 days. 
And this is because of how we have chosen to manage the watershed system in the upper Mississippi, but none of it is built for the world we're moving into. And from an energy perspective, your system reliability goes down significantly if your substation is underwater or your transmission lines are on fire. And so there's a lot of, of real vulnerability there too. Yeah, there's um, a good I, point. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, please. Yeah, um, maybe an, an intuitive way of, of saying what Elizabeth, I think, was saying is, our, for example, water management infrastructure is, is built, there's always the 100 year risk or maybe 50 year or 100 year flood for which people plan. But what used to be a 100 year flood will become a 10 year flood or so. And we're not, not ready for it. Power lines, that's actually another good example. Um, they're affected also by heat, not just by fire. Um, their efficiency and it, it's yet another example of our infrastructure is not well adapted to what's coming. Well, and I think also, as you were mentioning, the infrastructures in developing countries that can be even more fragile, it's not only the first order effects of a big storm coming through Mozambique, it's the second order effects of cholera outbreaks that come from these incredible floods and inability to access people and help them. So thinking not only about the system going out, but what the concurrent health and human impacts are on those very fragile systems. Um, we had another question. Um, this one is for you, Typo. Many years ago, Wally Broker said that carbon sequestration, now called negative emission technology, is essential because of the difficulty in mitigating emissions. What do you think about the prospects of net? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, Wally, for those who don't know, Wally was one of the giants, maybe the most giant of the giants in our field. He, he passed away um, recently, a few months ago. Um, and he was a friend of mine. He, he, had, an, he had an interesting old fashioned way of, of, of doing science, which was calling people and it's a number of people he called. And I was one of them. And the, one, the last few years of his life, he had been advocating carbon sequestration. Let's get the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere. But at some point he said, look, the scale of the problem is everyone is emitting these 10 mid-sized passengers cars worth of carbon into the atmosphere. And you somehow have to get that out. That times seven billion or billions of people. The scale of the problem is so enormous. It, it, we just can't do it soon enough. That was his take. So the last two years of his life, actually, he was very passionate and about and dedicated towards alternatives to that. And he, he became very interested in geoengineering, modifying um, the amount of sunlight Earth absorbs as a way to buying some time. It's, it's sort of the, you know, that's maybe the social distancing of climate research is, is geoengineering. And Wally was thinking this is the better way um, for carbon sequestration. I think in the long run, so my own view here is, in the long run, what we need is cheap ways of producing electricity from renewable sunlight primarily. Once you can do that very cheaply, much more cheaply than what fossil fuels cost now, then that opens up a whole host of things we can do. The problem with getting carbon out of the atmosphere is that it costs energy and that has to come from somewhere. But if you produce energy, electricity cheaply from sunlight, then you can perhaps produce so much of it that you can begin sucking carbon out of the atmosphere effectively. But that would be decades from now before that can be done at scale, I think. I'll just jump in to add that there's a dedicated chapter in the book about geoengineering by Douglas McMartin and Kate Rick, and it addresses not just the scientific issues that Tapio has raised, but also some of the social ethical issues. I'm going to ask Maybe one that... more question and then change it back to Philippe, and then we're out of time. But I think these are great conversations that we're all hungry to have. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, last question, I think, is for Sheila and Deborah. I'm curious to hear more about how high up movements to give legal rights to elements of nature have gained support. Are there countries where there's been shown to drive, that's been shown to drive significant change in climate policy? So uh, there are some countries that have given rights to nature in, in varying ways, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, effects, it's much more ambiguous. So you can go from something like Ecuador's constitution that gives rights to um, um, natural resources to more selective things like granting uh, constitutional rights to primates or uh, saying that 
there must be some kind of explanation that or responsibility on the part of citizens towards nature, which is there in the Indian constitution. But these are often fairly recent or new provisions. They haven't, uh, they don't carry with them a history of how things ought to be articulated. Um, I think that um, rather than dwelling uh, too much on these new provisions, which are philosophically exciting and important, uh, one might equally look at the ways in which without explicitly saying that natural resources have rights, nevertheless, we have in effect articulated such uh, beliefs. So for instance, um, I think the whole idea of the precautionary principle, which is much more widespread and which I think has had effects, uh, can be said to be rest, resting on um, that kind of uh, idea of responsibility towards the earth and towards a need to look for alternatives when we think we're going too far and inflicting too much damage. One of the political questions that interests me is the in some ways inexplicable standoff between North America, well, not North America, the United States part of North America and Europe on this question of the precautionary principle. And I think it's deeply misunderstood in the US what Europeans mean by the precautionary principle. Of course, the Europeans don't help by having multiple meanings, but nevertheless, I would sooner, I mean, for more sort of immediate handholds on law and public policy, I would sooner turn there than to the relatively less tested constitutional prescriptions and prohibitions, which don't yet have the, the interpretive infrastructure to back them up in my view. And just one comment on the previous discussions about infrastructure, I do think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're not only talking about storm drains, right? I mean, that is, that is the infrastructure for accommodating the kinds of changes we're looking to include social institutions as well, such as, for instance, what are the liability provisions and the insurance provisions for the kinds of damage that we're looking at and what kinds of uh, social connectivity or resilience infrastructures do we have? And there are examples already of disasters that have happened that show that even countries with relatively vulnerable or weak um, physical infrastructures can nevertheless cope with certain kinds of challenges better because they have communitarian social infrastructures. And I think that goes back, Tapio, to your point that even though Zoom allows us to have these virtual connections, uh, you and your group are dying to get back to personal connections. So I don't want to lose sight of that need for the social infrastructures to be attended to every bit as much as the material ones. I want to make sure that Philippe has his uh, moments to close. Thank you, everybody, for a, a wonderful discussion and, and, and to Philippe. Right. Well, just uh, maybe uh, 30 seconds to wrap up and first and foremost to thank everyone for participating in the conversation to all of the contributors to the book. It is indeed an interesting time to be having this discussion. It's abundantly clear now, if it wasn't before, that we're all sitting in the same bathwater together. And that means that the only way forward clearly is together. And, and that notion, I think, does fly very much in the face of some rising trends of, of nationalism and isolation, isolationism. And I hope very much that each of us can do our part to, to strike out against those tendencies to recognize that there is value from many perspectives from many parts of the world and sometimes the most useful things that we hear are the most unanticipated. So let us uh, celebrate serendipity and free exchange of ideas because I think in that we'll find some surprises that that may be helpful in this very difficult journey that we have in front of us. So thank you once again and uh, it's been a, a real pleasure and honor to be uh, a part of this. Thanks Philippe. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have a wonderful weekend. Thank right. you for hosting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.